Welcome to Lesson 1, Use Tax Tables and Schedules. Our objectives are in filing status classifications, to calculate tax liability by using tax tables and schedules, and to represent income range as an inequality. Ultimately, the goal behind filing your taxes on April 15th is to find out how much am I going to owe or how much am I going to get a refund for. So we're going to start off this unit just showing you some of the different ways that the IRS calculates you. The tax tables and schedules are considered a graduated tax schedule and I'm going to show you why that is. So before we get started looking at the different schedules and tables, you need to understand what your filing status is. Taxes are calculated based on your filing status. On every tax return that you file and fill out, here, for example, is the 1040. You'll notice that there's an area here for filing status, and there's five different selections. So let's watch a quick video on how to fill this out. Our topic du jour is selecting your filing status. Mmm, du jour. You may have noticed when trying to select your filing status that you qualify for more than one. Or you notice that you don't fit in any of these statuses because you're freaking awesome. You really should file that way. I'm sure it won't trigger an audit. You actually always do fit into one category or another, because if you were never married, and you don't have any kids or other dependents, then you are almost certainly in the single category. Why does the federal government always harp on the fact that I'm single? It actually gets a lot worse, because if you are single, holding all other items of income and deductions equal, meaning my girlfriend is a deadbeat, then you will pay the highest tax rate per dollar of income, and you'll have fewer exemptions and deductions. In fact, even if you are legally married, you may still have to file as single, if you are what is called considered unmarried meaning you and your spouse didn't live together for a single day in the last six months of the year. But I thought we were just taking a break. Moving on, the next filing statuses are married filing jointly and married filing separately. Because of a Supreme Court case called U.S. v. Windsor, if you actually are legally married under your state's law and you are not considered unmarried, then you can check either of these boxes. In the vast majority of cases, you'll want to check married filing jointly because that will result in the lowest tax. But you are jointly and severally liable for all taxes due for both you and your spouse if you file a joint return. Ah, so if you're married to a tax cheat, then you file it separately. I get it. Basically, yes. Next, we have head of household with qualifying dependent. This status is for unmarried persons who provide a home for certain qualifying individuals. A taxpayer can file as head of household if the taxpayer is, one, single or considered unmarried on the last day of the tax year, two, paid more than half the cost of keeping up a home, and three, either has a qualifying dependent living in the home for more than half the year, or paid more than half the cost for the entire year of keeping up a dependent parent's home, which may include a rest home. That's a mouthful. Lastly, you may be a qualifying widower with dependent child. This can be a little tricky because if your spouse died during the tax year for which you are filing your return, even if it was on January 1st, then that tax year you get to file as married filing jointly or married filing separately, a more preferential tax rate. Thereafter, for two years, you can file as qualifying widower with dependent child, but only if you have one or more qualifying dependents and you do not remarry. But if you do remarry, then you can file as married filing jointly again anyway. So the federal government is actually preventing you from selecting a less favorable tax status. I'm touched. Who said the federal government doesn't have a heart? Hopefully that short video helped you to understand filing status. For most of you, you are single. Some of you may have children that you take care of and thus would be head of household. And just like the video stated, if you claim single, you're going to have the highest tax rate. If you claim head of household because you have a qualifying person, your child, or maybe even somebody else if you are taking care of a parent, your tax rate won't be nearly as high. Okay, let's look at something else. Here's a graph, and this table shows the average number of days it takes Americans to earn enough money to pay off their entire year's income tax debt. So what does that mean? It means that it shows the first day that the typical American would be working for themselves rather than working to pay off taxes. This date is called Tax Freedom Day, and you may have heard of it. So basically, in the year 2010, around here, April 9th, People had to work until April 9th, until they were working for themselves. So that means all the money they were earning up through April 9th probably went to pay their tax bill for the year. The Tax Freedom Day changes from year to year based upon a variety of economic factors. 
Notice the trend. This is why graphs are useful. The trend is, is going up. While we do have some peaks and valleys along the way, and it looks maybe like we might be going down a little bit, the trend over time, at least from the year 1900, has continued to increase. So we'll see where the trend goes over the next 10 years. Let's now use a tax table to calculate a tax liability. So the IRS can provide tax tables and they look like this. If line 43, which is your taxable income, is at least, and then there's a column here, but less than, and then there's another column, and you are, and this is where your filing status comes into play. Are you single? Are you married filing joint? Are you married filing separate? Are you head of household? So depending upon your filing status, you'll pick one of these rows. So let's look at our example. Ron is single. He's using an IRS tax form and calculates that his taxable income is going to be $51,482. The instructions tell him to use the tax table, which is this, to determine his taxes. Now before we find his taxes, let's practice using a compound inequality to express his income, and then we'll see how much he owes in taxes. And the reason we're doing this is because in our next lesson, we're going to go back and write some piecewise functions. And if you remember that each function depends upon the domain, which is an inequality. Okay, his income is in here. His income is 51,482. So it sits here in this interval. So how can we write a compound inequality? Well, if you remember, we need to have an X term in the middle, if it's compound, and then we need to just put our range on the left and right. So we want x to be at least, it says. So what is at least? Well, that's greater than or equal to at least that amount, 51,450. So x is greater than or equal to this amount. That means it's at least that amount. And then it says, but less than. So it can't equal 51,500, it has to be less than 51,500. So that would look like this. All right, we have now written a compound inequality to express this income. Let's find his tax. Well, he is single, so we would need to look in this column for single, and we could circle his tax that he owes, $9,213. And depending upon how much he had withheld from his paychecks each month, he may or may not owe this full amount. He may get a refund if he had more than 9,000 withheld, or he may owe if he had less. Let's look at another example. Now we're going to use a tax schedule. Maria and Don are married taxpayers filing a joint return. So notice right here, this is the tax schedule or married filing jointly, or the qualifying widower would fit in here too. We have separate tax schedules if you're a single or head of household. Their combined taxable income is 153,900. The IRS offers a tax schedule so they can calculate their tax. We want to use a compound inequality like last time to express their income. Well, let's figure out where their income fits. If your taxable income is over 131, 450, definitely not over 200, so we're going to be in here, but not over 200,000. So we are in here. Let's write our inequality. So remember, and this is going to be a little bit different, this one says if your taxable income is over, so that doesn't mean at least, that means it has to be more than that. So we have 131,450, and it has to be greater than that. It has to be over that amount. It has to be 131,451, for example, but not over this amount. So it could be that amount. It just can't be over that amount. That means we have a less than or equal to. So this is a little bit different than the last one we just did. There's our compound inequality. Now we have to calculate the tax. This isn't quite as easy because it doesn't give us a tax. We have to calculate it. 
here's what it says. The tax is going to be 25,550 plus 28% of the amount over 131,450. So let's go ahead and write an equation for that. And we'll say that y is going to be equal to the tax due. So pause the video and see if you can write an equation and then come back and see if you have the right answer. So hopefully you wrote 25,550 because they're going to owe that no matter what. Plus we're going to be charged 28%, so we have to write that as a decimal, 28% times what? Well, the amount over 131,450. X represents their income. So we take their income minus the 131,450. And that is how we can calculate how much they owe. Now all we need to do is plug in their income. Okay, so we have 25,550 plus 28% of the amount, which is 153,900, over 131,450. And then we can just use our calculator to figure out this amount. Subtracting these two, I get 22,450 taxed at the 28%. That's how much of their income is taxed at that higher rate. And that amount comes to $6,286 plus the $25,550 that they would owe on the income below $131,000. So if we add that together, Combined tax would be $31,836 on an income of $153,900. Hopefully now you're starting to understand how these tax schedules work. Basically, this amount here is the amount of tax that's owed from the previous interval. So if you were in this second interval here, you would owe the tax on the first $16,000, which is 10% of this, or $1,600 approximately, plus the tax on the amount from 16 to 65,000, which is taxed at a rate of 15%. Remember when we were talking about a graduated tax schedule? This is a good example of how that works. The more money that you make, the higher the tax bracket. But it doesn't mean that if you make over 357,000 that all your income is taxed at 35%. It just means that the amount over 357,000 is taxed at that. So each chunk of income that you make over certain thresholds is taxed at a higher amount. Okay, and that concludes our lesson today on tax rates and schedules. Hopefully at this point now you understand filing status classifications and you might know or be thinking about where you fit in. You can also calculate a tax liability using both tax tables and schedules, and you can represent income range as an inequality.